And so you started clapping, and that's an appropriate response to the songs. But I'm glad it wasn't me. I have no, like, this is how far my non-musical talent extends. I don't even know what's going on in songs. I just am in the back and trying to yell something that hopefully is somewhat in tune with the thing or whatever. And often I'm sitting next to Elizabeth or standing next to Elizabeth when we're singing. And I'll just, I'll just keep, I'll think we're going to the next thing. But then they break into one of those, oh, 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 oh. And I'm just like, I'm on to the next lyric. I'm on to the next lyric. So. Anyways, it was. It was an unexpected tag. Great. I'm just glad it was you and not me. That's all. That's all I'm saying. All right. How are you guys feeling this morning? All right. Hey, where are my 49er fans at? Okay. So you guys are feeling really good. So first, let me just get this out of my system. Boo. Boo on you for beating my Dallas Cowboys. Boo on you guys. Hey, but, but... Congratulations to you on beating the Green Bay Packers and making it to the NFC Championship game. Aaron Rodgers is 0-4 against the 49ers in the playoffs. That's crazy to me. And I was watching the game yesterday, and I just, I didn't think it was going to happen. I was like, man, that's, and it was funny because they were interviewing Jimmy Garoppolo afterwards, and they're like, man, how did you do it? How did you blah, blah, blah? How did you persevere? And I was like, he didn't throw any touchdowns, and he threw an interception. He didn't do anything. What are you talking about? But anyways, what, I guess you got to grab someone, and he's good looking, so grab him and talk to him on the microphone afterwards, so whatever. But anyways, congratulations to 49er fans. A couple of things before we get into the message this morning. I want to tell you this. Uh, for those of you who are praying, our dog uh, got sick this weekend. We don't know what happened, but our, I came home, he was sick, and we wind up having to take him to an emergency appointment the vet. They looked at him, they said, okay, here's some medicine, take him home, and then he didn't seem to get any better, and actually, we think, got a little bit sicker, and so we took him to another emergency vet appointment, Uh, and we were, that was a blessing in itself. So hard, by the way, to find a place that's actually taking emergency uh, appointments right now. Everybody is full to capacity, so that was an answer to prayer and a blessing to us that we were able to get him into a place, and they said, hey, let us take him in, let us, uh, we'll treat him, and so they have him. They called us this morning and said, hey, it looks like he's improving, but we'd still like to hold on to him for another night just to just to kind of make sure he's you know completely up and going before he comes home so thank you guys so much for your prayers and if you would continue to pray elizabeth and i would really appreciate it i know for some of you guys you're like are we talking about a dog at church or what uh but it's just funny you you love what god gives you to love that's just the way it is and our heart is is just full for for our dogs and um i i really appreciate your prayers second thing is this listen guys I wanted to start this. this. This hit me when I was on uh, vacation over, over Christmas. I felt like God put on my heart, I want, you to, I want you to do this thing called one thing. One thing that every Sunday you're challenging people, I want you to take home one thing. I don't care whether it's the, the, the lyrics to a song that we sang that really touched your heart. Maybe it's going to be a verse that we read. Maybe it's going to be something that's spoken in the message. But I want you to take home one thing. And here's what I really want you to do. I want you to share it. At least share it with me. Most of you have my phone number uh, because you're on the text list, so you can at least share it with me. But I also, I want you to start thinking about, like, man, I want to take home one thing, and I want it to be something that I can share with other people. Like, what, what is God saying to me this morning that other people need to hear? And maybe it's that. Maybe, maybe someone needs to hear your sins. If you're in Christ, your sins are dead and gone. Maybe someone needs to know that. Maybe they're really hard on themselves, and they need to hear that God loves them, and he's gone the distance for them. But I want you to be thinking about, as you start this morning, uh, not start, but as we get into this, I want you to think about one thing. So just have your ears open, have your heart open. We're going to take some time to pray right now, and I want you to just open your heart right now and say, God, I'm here. Speak to me. Give me something. Tell me something that, that needs to stay with me, that needs to go with me, or possibly I need to pass on to someone else. All right? You guys hear me? You guys with me? As the kids say this day, are you here for that? All right, all right. Let's, let's take a moment and pray. Invite God into your space. Invite God to speak to you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you, Father, for the ways that you answer our prayers. Father, thank, the, thank you for the ways that you hold us during our trials, Father. Thank you, Father, that whatever happens during our trials, you're good. You're there. You're working for the good. Thank you for the work that you've already done, Father, that saves us. That there's a promise awaiting us that we're just now beginning to step into. Father, bless this time. Make it holy. Make this a time where you meet us and you speak to us. Make this a time, Father, where we hear your voice and we know that this is a connection time. 
Father, we open ourselves to you. We come to hear from you. And we ask all of these things for your glory and in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask you if you're here, I'm going to ask you to go ahead. Stand up real quick. Stand up. Stand up. Shake it out. Come on, even you introverts, stand up. Stand up. Even our tall friends, go ahead. I know it's a longer trip for you. Go ahead. Stand up. Shake it out. Listen, if you're home and you're watching on the stream, stand up, shake it out. If you're home watching on the stream, you can write down your one thing. You can write it down in the chat. Uh, You guys, don't shout it out as I'm doing my thing, but just write it down somewhere and you can share it later. But thank you guys so much. Shake it out. You guys ready for this morning? All right. You can be seated. We are talking about this idea of evolution as a Christian. What does it look like to grow as a Christian? And we've been talking about these different things where we think like, well, you know, we know we're supposed to grow as a Christian. We know we're supposed to look like Jesus. And we've been looking at different verses that tell us that each morning. But what does it look like? You know, some people think like, well, I get, I'm kind of a better person. Or some people think, well, now I come to church and I didn't used to come to church, so that must be it, right? And, and so we're looking at these things that either they're things that it looks like for you to grow into, or maybe you're already doing it. You're like, man, that's me. I'm there. I used to be like this, but now I'm like that. Or for some of you, we might look at it and say, this is a goal to shoot for. It's something that we need to kind of drink in, take in, and make some plans to get there, right? You ever, you ever have those moments with yourself where you're like, you have a thought, and you're like, I should be like this. Anybody else ever, like in a moment, like, and it doesn't happen just in an argument or in a whatever, but you have these thoughts and you're like, you know what, I should be, sometimes it happens to me, I'm watching a movie, and I'm a movie person, I really like hero movies, anything where there's a hero involved, in fact, I don't generally like movies where there's no one to root for, or there's not a, even if there's someone to root for by cultural standards, but there's not a good guy or good girl in the movie, it doesn't really appeal to me, I really like heroes, and sometimes I'm watching a movie and I'm like, I should be like that. I should, be, I should be more courageous. I should be more honest. I should be more, you know, friendly. I should be more, you know, I don't know if you have that or not. But sometimes we have those moments, and, and it's hard for us to differentiate. Well, what's good according to the culture, and what's good according to God? And when we look at our growth, sometimes that's a problem for Christians. We mix it up. We're like, well, I think I'm growing according to what the culture says. According to the people around me, they like me. They think I'm great. But what is God saying? So we've been looking at these different things. Today, I want to talk about this idea. Can you bring that slide up? From earthly to eternal. One of the ways that we're supposed to grow, one of the ways that that we're supposed to become like Jesus is we're supposed to develop an eternal perspective. Everybody say that out loud with me. Eternal perspective. We're supposed to develop an eternal perspective. In fact, that's what carried Jesus through so many of his trials. Can you imagine what it was like to be Jesus? I mean, I know that we're, we're always like, oh, Jesus, you know, you're, you were God, so everything was so easy for you. But can you imagine, like, the very people that you've fallen in love with, and, and, and you have moments in your life where you're reminded, oh, I'm in, I'm in love with something. I feel for something. When, when, you know, this little dog, let me just, just say this a real tangent real quick. Elizabeth and I never wanted a small dog. And no offense to any of you who have chihuahuas. I know they're very, very popular. No offense to any of you who have chihuahuas. We never even really liked small dogs. We're big dog people, okay? We, we, we never really even think of, what well, we didn't used to think of small dogs as dogs at all, really. They were just kind of like another breed of cat, essentially, <laughs> right? And, and, and then, all of a sudden, we moved into this house a few years back, and <laughs> Elizabeth's unpacking a box. I mean, we had just moved in. Elizabeth's unpacking a box that's in front of a window that faces our backyard, and she looks out there, and there's this little dog out in our backyard, and we just think like, oh, it must be one of the neighbor's dogs or something like that. She goes out there, she tries to find, is it your dog, your dog, your dog, nobody's dog. Uh, we're like, huh, somehow this dog wandered into our, uh, into our backyard and, it, and then just came right into our house. Like, well, sure, why not? And we've got like a big boxer, a big 80-pound boxer at that time. Uh, it just wanders right in like, hey, guys, how you doing? You know? And you think like, oh, it must have belonged to the person who lived here before us because we just moved in and maybe they couldn't find their dog and blah, blah, blah. Nope, she didn't have dogs and didn't like animals, so it wasn't hers. So, We try and find the owners. We can't find the owners. We decide we're going to keep this little guy or whatever. And he becomes ours. And we just fall in love with him. And we don't like little dogs. And he does all the little dog things that little dogs do. You know what I mean? Like big dogs are like go outside and pee. And little dogs are like right there in the middle of your house. Right? On your carpet. I don't know why they don't do it on the laminate flooring. They just like to find carpet to pee on. I don't know what that is. But he starts, he does all the little dog things. Like someone comes to the door. Yep, 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 which he still does to this day. 
the ping thing got over. But anyways, we fall in love with him. It's like God said, like, you think you know you, but I know you. We fall in love with this old dog. And yesterday when they came out and said, yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and keep him overnight. I mean, th- that's great. That's actually the best thing for him. Uh, we can't get fluids into it, but they can do it intravenously, so it's the best thing for them. But still, it's like as soon as they said that, I, ju- I just tear up. And I'm like, oh, but that's my, that's my, d- I, he, he knows us. He wants to be with us. You know, and you, you, you feel, they, they might not feel this at all, but you feel that like their fear, uncomfort of like, wait, 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 why am I not with my people? It's an amazing thing, the things that we fall in love with. And, and can you imagine Jesus the way we feel about like your, your, your significant other, your spouse, your child, your pet, whatever it may be, Jesus loves more than you do and loves those things more than you do and has come to give his life for all these people and they completely reject him. They talk about stoning him. He tries to give them the best way to live and they're like, we don't want to do it that way. They torture him. They crucify him. Can you imagine what it's like and what carries him through? This eternal perspective. This idea that this isn't it. There's something coming that's even better. The enemy comes and tries to tempt Jesus. And Jesus says, no way, man. I've got something so much better than what you're offering me. And and what he had that was better was not life here and now. He was talking about his relationship with the Father, and heaven to come. Jesus says, listen, I've got this eternal perspective. I'm not from this world. And here's an interesting thing. He says, neither are you. Here's this verse. He says this in John. If the world hates you, so this is the night that he's kind of, he's, this is, he's telling his disciples, like, man, it's about to happen. I'm about to be taken away from you. And he's kind of given him, like, the, the last instructions. Like, you're, you're about to go on a road trip, and you're leaving your kids home for the first time. And you're like, okay, guys, remember, you know, do the dishes. Put your food away. Close the refrigerator door. Don't drive the car. You know, all those things. He's given him all the last-minute instructions, right? And he explains this to him. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind, it hated me first, even though I love it, even though it was made by me and for me, even though I'm giving my life for it, it hated me first. If you belong to this world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. And then just a little bit later, he prays this for them. He says, he's talking to the Father, and he says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that you may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. He says, this is great. This thing, it's, it's beautiful, this earth, this creation. There's so many things about it that are wonderful and beautiful. But he says, this isn't the way it was supposed to be, and you weren't made for this. You are made for something even better. He's saying, you need to know there's something more. And in order to hang on, in order to become like me, you have to develop an eternal perspective, a thing that looks to that and makes that the center of life. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, which is a weird prayer. Why not? Because he's like, because there's other people that I came for that I want to take them out of the world too, that I want them to know they were created for me and for heaven. I don't want you to take them out. I want them to be lights to the world. I want them to shine. I want them to be ambassadors for me, witnesses that tell people about who I am and how I love them. It says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, which is so often is our prayer, right? I'm so done with this. I'm so done with pain. I'm so done with with sickness. I'm so done with death. I'm so done with injustice. I'm so done with bad drivers. People who stand in line at the movie theater, at the concession line, but then they get up there and don't know what they're ordering. We're like, just that's it, Jesus. Just take me home, right? 
He says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Next slide. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Let me translate for you. This is not your home. This is not your home. I, I know it feels like it. You want to make it that way. and that if You're trying to make it so that you belong and it fits and it works. But Jesus is saying, it's not your home. And, 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 and your home is even better. As much as you love about this, your home is even better. That's what I'm doing here. I'm making a way for you. Sanctify them. Set them apart by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Do you know that you've been sent? I know we kind of like to just come here and do our thing on Sunday, and we keep the windows kind of like, you know, like this privacy so people can't see or whatever, but it's like, you've been sent into the world. That's why, that's why Jesus is saying, don't take them out of the world. They've got a job. They've got a mission. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them. For them, I sanctify myself. I'm setting myself apart so that they too may be truly sanctified. I'm giving myself to you, God, so that they can be set apart. They can become yours again. Wow. Jesus loves you. I know you're going through some stuff. I know circumstances happen that you're like, ah, is God watching? Is he listening? This doesn't seem fair. Why is this happening to me? He loves you. And he's saying, man, I know it hurts here. In this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world, and now you're mine. So you and I have overcome the world together, and you're going to be with me in the even better. Right? Hey, this is tough for us. He's saying, you've got to develop an eternal perspective. He's telling his disciples, you have to see it different. If you see this as home, you'll never want to leave this place. You'll do different things for this place. So you have to start thinking of home as heaven. So what does that look like for us to develop a mindset that moves from earthly to eternal? What does it look like to say, this is not my home, and I need to stop treating it that way? Well, I want to give you three indicators. Listen, all of these things are about growth. I'm really sorry if you, if this, you know, some of these things kind of poke at us sometimes. And I want you to know when I preach things, they poke at me too. Even when I'm preaching, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's for you. But sometimes they poke at us and everything. It's not meant to make anybody feel bad. It's to give us points so that we know where we're going. If we're lost, we want to know, how do we get back to the road, right? And if you're lost enough, you don't care if the sign says, the road is that way, dummy. You just want to get back to the road. Well, that's what these are about. So maybe this is you and you're, you're making the journey. You're like, man, that's great. I thought so. I see that in myself. Wonderful for you. I love it. Maybe for you, you're like, oh, yeah, that's, I find myself more on this end, and I need to move that way. Great. It's an indicator. Start making some plans. Start moving in that direction. The first thing is this. If we're going to develop an earthly perspective, we have to move from mine to his. From mine to his. There's this great verse in the Bible, and it says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. I listened to a sermon one time, and uh, the, the pastor would say, he, he, he did kind of a, like a trick question kind of thing on everybody. And he said, he read this verse, he said, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He says, how many of you guys own a car? You know, all right. How many of you guys own a house? He says, uh, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He says, how many of you guys own it? And he just kept going on this list or whatever. And then he would just read the verse louder and louder every time until they finally caught on. It's like, oh, you don't. You pay for a car. You pay for a house, but it's God's. Isn't that crazy? I know we're like, no, well, he doesn't make the mortgage payment. I'll tell you that right now. But he kind of does. And the Bible says that. The Bible says, what do you have that you have not been given? I'll tell you this. Uh, the place that we found to take the dog that would take him in to take Otis uh, was in El Dorado Hills. And I'll tell you something that I found out yesterday. People in El Dorado Hills make a lot more money than people in Carmichael. I'll tell you that when they gave me the bill. 
But here's what was great. Normally, we would look at that and we'd be like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? And it'd be one of those things where it's like, man, I feel bad for my dog, but I also, this, is, this makes me so angry, gets the bill and blah, 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 and all these kind of things. But I'll tell you this, it's so awesome. Elizabeth, just, just, just over this Christmas vacation, received a bonus from her work. And so we actually had money in our bank account. We're like, well, great. God does pay the bills. We don't always see it. We don't always correlate it. It's not always that easy, but it's like, I told Elizabeth, I said, no, we're, we're, we're putting him in. We have the money. Like, go, take him, make him well. From mine to his, and that's part of our issue is that we look at stuff and we're like, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. And when stuff happens to it, when things go wrong, we're like, you're messing with my stuff. Sometimes we even, what are you doing? How could you take that from me? Don't you know? You know, our jobs, our bank account, our health, the health of the people or the, the things that we love. We're like, God. And God's like, well, hold on. That's mine. See, here's what I want to tell you right now. You're talking about moving from mine to his. All your stuff, all of it, even the things that you consider treasure here. God is saying, it's, it's really mine. And I'll do with it what I want. And I don't need to, I don't need to tell you that, it, that it's fair. I don't need to show you that it's fair. You don't need to get it. How many people are reading the Bible in a year with us and just read through Job? How many people are doing that, right? How many people you read Job and you're like, I, I've been a Christian for I don't know how many years. I still don't get it. Like, are you kidding me? You know, and my little sister pointed out, my little sister's doing it with us. She lives in Texas, but she's doing it with us. And she pointed out, she's like, God literally says to the enemy, have you considered Job? Like, that's not what I want God to do for me. I don't want the enemy looking at me. I want the enemy to overlook me. This is where I'm, I'm happy that I'm short. Like, just look right over me. Don't look at me. Don't consider me. And, and it's tough. God is saying, it's all mine. Even your people, even your spouse, even your children, they're mine. I know you love them, and I want you to love them. I want you to care for them the way I would care for them on the earth if I were in your situation. They're still mine. Everything's mine. And that's one of our issues. We, we struggle to grow sometimes because we're kind of like, but it's mine, though. And we take such a, a tight grip of the things that we have that we really struggle when they're taken out of our grasp or when something grabs onto them as well and starts pulling against them. Man, that doesn't mean you don't pray. That doesn't mean you don't hope. It just means we develop this perspective that says, God, everything's yours. I trust you. I know you're always working for the good. And I trust you. My faith and my hope are in you. You're my rock and my fortress, my salvation. I had to tell you, it, <clears throat> this is a lot easier in third world countries. This is a lot easier when you wake up in the morning and you don't go, how am I going to make today the most comfortable day ever? You go, how am I going to survive? And you're looking forward to the eternal. I tell you, it's much tougher in, in Western culture countries because we're way more affluent. And we don't wake up in the morning going like, how am I going to get through the day? We wake up in the morning, we're like, okay, how is this day going to be the easiest it possibly can be on me? Like, I mean, you go out of the country and go to one of their grocery stores. And then come back to the States. And actually, that's one of the things you struggle with when you go on a long-term mission trip or a mission trip somewhere else. And you go there and you're eating the food and everything like that. And then you come home and you go to Safeway and you're like, I'm a little overwhelmed by how much food is in here. And how much food I know is going to go out the back door today because some didn't buy it but it's past its date for americans and so it's just going to get tossed or whatever it is you're overwhelmed by that it's tougher for us in that capacity because you have more and you believe it's yours because you earned it you got the education you paid the bill you whatever the way we develop one of the ways that is an indicator that we develop an eternal perspective is we say, it's not mine, it's his, everything is his. That's what Job says. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. It's all his, the Lord be praised. It's all his. Now, he's not happy. He still has questions, but he gets it. He's like, it's all God's. 
This is a tough one too. But when God says to Abraham, there's a man in the Bible named Abraham. God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a son. And after 25 years, God finally gives him a son. He's like 100 years old when he has a son, his first son. And so he loves that son. It's, it's, it's everything to him, the, the little boy named Isaac, right? And at some point, God comes to him and says, hey, I want you to give me Isaac. I want you to give me Isaac. And the way you would do that in the Old Testament is you would, you would sacrifice him. And Abraham's like, okay. See, Abraham knew he's yours. I mean, I love him. I fathered him. But he's yours. That's, and I'm yours. If that's what you want, that's what I do. From mine to his. What are you holding on to so tight that you won't let go? What are you holding on to? And you can tell this. When someone else grabs it, you, you start to get a little ornery. You start to get a little, uh, 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 uh. Hmm. Like, raise your hand in here if you own a car. I'm not tricking you like the other pastor was. I'm just, I, know, I just said that, so you're like, right? Raise your hand if you have insurance on your car. Okay? Raise your hand if you've ever been in an accident that was not your fault, and you got out of the car, and you're like, what are you doing? Are you kidding me? What just happened? You, have you ever been one of those people, like, you get in an accident, and they're like, oh, no big deal. It's got, we got insurance. But you're driving a Tesla. That's what insurance is for. You can tell the things you hold on to really tightly because when something else grabs it, whatever it may be, a person, circumstances, whatever, you start getting a little ornery. And one of the ideas behind an eternal perspective is that you don't hold it so tightly because you're like, you hold it like this. You're like, God, it's all yours. Thank you for putting it in my hands. There are plenty of people that, in the Bible that God put lots of stuff in their hands. All those guys, Abram was rich. Jacob was rich. David was rich. Solomon was rich. There are plenty of people that God put plenty of stuff in their hands. But God's like, hold it like this because it's really mine. I'll give it to you to steward, to hold, to experience its beauty and joy. We, we have pets. And the worst thing about having a pet is not... <laughs> It's not having to clean up after them. It's not the furniture they chew when they're, like, young. I don't know how many pairs of glasses I went through with Max. The worst thing about having a pet is that generally you outlive them. And you can either have the perspective of, God, why now? Or, man, God, I'm so grateful that you put this beauty in my life. It brought this dog, this person, this whatever, brought so much joy and beauty into my life but they're yours, from, from mine to yours. What are you holding on to super tightly that you need, to, you need to start saying, God, this is yours, man. I need to develop a different mindset on this. Next is from partier to prepper, from partier to prepper. We, we like to live in the now for this moment. In fact, there's a song like way back in the 90s, this will date me, but there's a song way back in the 90s, and there's, the girl sings, she's like, I keep living this day like the next will never come. And it's a really interesting song, it's a secular song, but like you read it and you're like, oh man, that could be a Christian that wrote that. She's like, what I need is a good defense. But I keep living this day like the next will never come, and, and we kind of do that. That's the way we live life. That's the way we give in to temptation. Ah, make up for it on Sunday. Ah, God will forgive me. I'll go down to the altar at some point. This thing that's been plaguing me that I keep doing over and over and over again that I know I shouldn't, I'm going to handle it one of these days. And we got to move from that, that moment where it's like, this is life, this is now, live in the now, carpe diem, it's a party, to this idea that, like, there's a day coming. There's a day coming. There's one thing where Jesus says this. He says, don't store up treasures for yourself on earth where moth and rust destroy, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Treasures that are eternal. And, and what he's saying there is like, live for eternity. Don't live for the now. Like you're investing in this stuff. It's like better neighborhood, better house, better car, better every, all these kind of things. And he's like, don't live for the now. Live for the then. And that's not just with material things. The, the idea is deeper than that. The idea is in the way that you think. 
and what you're planning for. He says, plan for the day that's coming. You know, there are all kinds of passages in the Bible that say, you know, where they say, come Jesus, come. That's one of the ways that Revelation ends. It says, come Jesus, come. God says in, in a lot of really scary ways, there's a day coming where you're not going to have a chance to choose anymore, where everything is going to stop. And whatever choices you've made, that's going to be it. You're going to have to live with them. And, and so Jesus is constantly preaching, repent from your sins. Prepare for the life to come. Get ready for it. Live that way like there's another life coming. And that's the one you're investing in. Let me ask you something. When you think about your actions, when you think about how you're living, when you think about the things that you're doing, which life are you investing in? The here and the now, the earthly, or the eternal? Are you doing things that maybe right now you don't get credit for? They don't seem fair. But, as the Bible says, God sees and he rewards. His reward is heaven. Like, we're always like, I talk to people and they're like, I'll be nice to them when they're nice to me. And that's the way we live. And God's like, man, no, I want you to do it because it's the right thing to do. And I see it, even if it's not returned by the person or your boss or the culture, I see it and I will reward you. Are you living in the now? Or are you preparing for the future, this life that Jesus says, you're not of this world. This is not your home. And the more that you make it your home, the less you want to leave it. The more that you make this life your home, the more that you're not focused on the next life and preparing for the next life, the more you're investing in this one right now, the harder it is when God says, like, hey, I've got something for you that has to do with the next life. And you're like, uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. I got too much going on down here, God. Oh, you want me to go do that thing over there for you? I can't, God. I've got, I've got plans in the works, and I'm doing things here. I don't have time. I can't spend my finances on that, God, because I'm doing this. One of the ways that we know that we've moved from earthly to eternal is when we stop thinking so much about the now. We stop investing so much in the now, and we start living life as if we're investing in the next life, in that day to come, where we start storing up treasures in heaven. And then the next is this, from hostile to hopeful. How many people, let's we're, be honest because you're in church and even if you're on the stream, you're, you're kind of in church. So be honest about this. Raise your hand. How many people, when something doesn't go right for you, your immediate reaction is you're upset, you're angry, you're grumpy, you're grouchy. Raise your hand, right? Now there are some people that aren't like that. There are some people like, oh, that's a bummer. And I've always longed to be like those people. I'm not like that. In fact, for me, everything filters through anger. Everything. Like even yesterday, we're getting news about this and stuff, and I'm, I'm calling people, and they're like, no, you know, Friday night, I'm calling people, and I'm like, hey, can, I'd, I'd like to bring my dog, and you guys still open? And they're like, yeah, we are an emergency place, but we're full up. And number after number after number after number that I'm calling, they just keep saying the same thing. And I'm looking at my dog, and he's there, and he's like, Mwah. and I'm worried. And, and, and here's the thing. I'm scared. I feel helpless. But you know how it comes out for me? I'm pissed. I start getting angry. Now, I did really good this time, but normally it's like I would, I would, I would start getting lippy on the phone. Or if you're in person, I would start getting lippy in person. I know you're like, man, you're only this tall. Who are you going to get lippy with? Some of the, uh -huh. But no, I'm, I'm a lippy person. But that's, a, you know, when things happen, this is one of the indicators you've begun to move from earthly to eternal is that, you know, our... A normal, I won't say our, a normal human reaction is when things don't go your way, you get upset. You get a little hostile. You get a little like, Mwah. How many people, like, your initial reaction when someone wrongs you is like, okay, well, let's do it. Right? And maybe for you, like, maybe, maybe, now listen, because some of you are letting yourself off the hook. Some of you are like, I've never, ever, you know, wanted to fight someone or blah, blah, blah. I want to fight people all the time. But maybe you're not like that. Maybe you're like, no, I never, but, 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 you're ready, you're, you're ready to get into a fight verbally. You're ready to say a little jab. And some of you are like, no, I don't do that. I don't say those kind of things to people or whatever. And you're letting yourself off the hook, but you're on social media. 
And you don't say it to someone's face, not because you're being polite, but because you're kind of a coward. But you don't say it to someone's face. You go on social media and you're like, to the person who? To those people. Oh, I just can't believe how some people. And some of you, you're, you're like, nope, not me. Good. I escaped it all. Except for that in your head and your heart, you're holding it in, but you're still, you have the same hostility. You're like, you might not say anything and other people might not know. But in your head, you're like, rah, rah, rah. you ever see those scenes in movies where like something happens and all of a sudden the other person, like something happens to one person, the other person just goes off and they just hit someone and they just bang them and just all this kind of stuff or whatever like that. And then it flashes back and the other person just standing there and it was just, it was just a thought they had in their head. Some of you are that and you're like, hey, I'm doing good. I never hit anybody before in real life. And that's what Jesus is saying, man, if you've, if you've lusted for someone in your mind, you, you, already, you already did it. Look, if you hate your brother, you, you already murdered him. It's the same thing. You know, what, li- what lives in here, that's, that's what you've got to take care of. It's great that you're handling the actions, and that is important. I'm not trying to knock anybody down. That's important. But you've got to take care of what lives in here, too. And that's generally our reaction. When stuff happens to us, we get a little hostile. And instead, God is saying, listen, like Jesus, all these things are going on, and he doesn't want them to happen, by the way. Jesus goes to the garden, and he's like, eh, I know I'm about to be tortured and, 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 and just treated terribly and, and crucified and killed. And I'd rather not, if it's at all possible. And then he says this, to, this famous quote, he says to God, he says, but not my will, but yours be done. And essentially God's like, this, this is the way it has to be done. So God comes and angels strengthen Jesus and prepare him for this thing that he's got to go into. And here's what the Bible says about that moment. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He's like, yeah, this has to be done because I want these people back. And this is the only way that it can happen. Hope is part of the recipe for Christianity. I know we want it to be like you come to Jesus and nothing ever goes wrong again. And checks come in the mail that you didn't even expect and they pay all your bills. And you get all kinds of vacations and stuff like that. And, and, and that's just not the way Jesus says it. He says, no, no, that's the whole reason I came, because this world is broken, and that brokenness is going to touch your life too. But don't worry, I've overcome the world. That's what I'm doing here. That's what I've done. That's how I've shown you that I love you. And so I want you to be hopeful, not simply about the things that happen here, and that's okay, but especially that heaven awaits. Heaven is coming where there's no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. Amen? I mean, isn't that what we all long for? A place where there's no more pain? You're trying to make it here and it just doesn't work. And the problem is, when you try and make it here, you're usually, you wouldn't say this, but you're usually trying to do it at someone else's expense. We don't see it that way, we don't say it that way, and we try not to look too far to the side. But, and one of the things is, we have to stop being so angry and we have to start being more hopeful. Like, raise your hand if you've ever been hurt by someone or something ever in your life. Raise your hand if you harbor some ill feelings towards someone or something or some political system or some anything because it hurt you at some point in your life, right? And God is saying, I'm going to fix everything. I'm going to make it all right. And I want you to put your hope in that. Not the now, not the things that are happening. I understand broken things happen. They touch your life and it hurts. But I want you to have hope for the next. And let me tell you something. I'm going to say something that's hard to hear. If you don't have hope, it's going to be really hard for you to be an actual Christian. And I'm not saying that you didn't say the prayer. I'm not saying you don't come to church a lot. I'm saying if you don't have hope, it's going to be hard for you to be an actual Christian, to do Christian things, because it takes hope. Hope is this trust in God that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. That he can handle it, and even if he doesn't handle your circumstance, your situation, right now, it's already been handled by the cross. And one day it's going to be better. That's hope. And God is saying, hope. 
All through the Bible, you find it over and over and over again. Put your hope in God. Put your trust in God. Put your hope in God. My hope is in God. Over and over and over. All through the Bible. And it's something as weird, modern day, at least Western culture Christians, we don't do. We're, hope is like it's a, we don't even think about it. We think of hope as something like, well, if someone earns my hope, then, and Jesus is like, I did go to the cross. From hostile to hopeful. When things happen to us instead of, oh, that's it. Okay, God, what are you going to do here? The Bible says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. And, and it goes on to say, basically, because God is working. He's working. And he's growing you. And it says in another passage of scripture that God, when he's working, he's always working for the good. Okay, God, I don't know what you're going to do here. I don't know how you're going to do the situation, but you're at work. From hostile to hopeful. And if you're living in that hostile category, man, this is, we need to make the move. We need to make the move. Okay, God's going to open a door. He's going to make a way. And if he doesn't, I'm going to be okay. At some point, someday. Sean, you can come up. Do you have an eternal perspective? In order to be a Christian, you have to develop an eternal perspective because so much of what God is asking us to do, how he's asking us to see things, how he's asking us to live, how he's asking us to deal with the world around us and the people around us and the things that they do to us, is not based on the here and now. It's based on the then. It's based on this eternal promise that we have of life set right. And if you don't have an eternal perspective, you're going to struggle to live out the life that God is calling you to. Because you're always going to be wanting to, I'll do that, God, when I take care of this. I'll do that, God, when I'm set. And in this life, you're never going to be set. I tell that to young people. Young people are like, when I get over this trial then, and I'm like, let me tell you something. I don't want to burst your bubble. But man, one trial ends and the next trial begins. They're not always big. They're not always the same size. But that's just kind of the way it is. Sometimes people say it this way. It's like, oh, man, I'll start doing that, some of that stuff when I'm not as busy. Let me tell you something. You're never going to not be busy. You're never going to not be busy. That's just life. If you have kids, you're never going to not be busy. And you're going to think like, no, once they're 18, they move out. Finally, I can just travel and I can relax and blah, blah, blah. Nope, not at all. Then they're going to be calling you for money because they moved out and they, someone's got to pay the bills. And then they're going to move back in. Our hope, listen, listen, our hope is not in this life. Our hope is in the next. And one of the struggles that we have in Christianity is we want God to come in and fix everything that's in the here and now, that's in our life now. And God's like, that's, I did come. And I've set everything in motion so that it'll be fixed. But it's not the here and now. Is your hope in heaven. And maybe that's your journey this year to develop an eternal perspective. To start believing it's not mine, it's his. Start investing in the life to come. In the way that you think, in the way that you act, in the way that you treat people. That you would start moving from hostile to hopeful, that you would begin to have, it's like, yeah, I know, this isn't, this is broken, this is not fixed. But God, I know you're good. I know you're at work. I've got hope to see what you're going to do and how you're going to take care of things. Maybe that's your journey this year. What's your one thing today? Write it down. I'd love to hear it, and I'd love for you to share it. Just, you know, post it on Facebook or something like that. Got to develop an eternal perspective, guys. It's going to get you through so many trials where right now you're anchored, anchored to the here and now.